we're really fascinated with the sort of biology and 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 uh, mechanics of movement. We decided to teach a human bio seminar on movement, and and we we developed a tentative title for it, which was "Man in Motion," and. <laughs> we suddenly realized that we were being male chauvinist pigs <laughs> in the title. And so we had, to ch we had to change it. I was uh, standing in front of a, a, a new blackboard. It wasn't a blackboard, it was a whiteboard. And I was lecturing and all of a sudden, uh, I thought I was fainting and falling over backwards. What was actually happening was as I wrote on the board, it was hung loosely enough that it was receding from me when I got the impression that I was fainting. So that, but I've learned over the years to just turn around to the class and say, holy. It was cavernous, it was dark, we were up on a stage and the lectern they provided was for a man who would be on average six foot tall. And at five foot two, I couldn't be seen over the lectern. There was just a bobbing head. So the um, audiovisual people came in and they provided a little box for me to stand on so that I could be seen by the class. And it wasn't very wide. And one day in my great enthusiasm, I went to show them something on the blackboard and I stepped backwards and fell off this little box. I do a model of the, um, the neuron in which I have to blow up a rubber glove and that's gonna be the cell body. And one time I was in the class and blowing very hard on this thing, and I finally blew it up, and it came out of my hand and went right down into the mouth of a student in the front row. <laughs> and it was just very hard to recover from this because it was so funny and so unlikely. Another embarrassing incident um, occurred uh, less to do with anything about the program, but it had to do with my busy life at the time. I had three young children. I had newborn twins and a three-year-old. And every day as I would prepare to go to uh, human biology, when the core was from nine to 11, I would get the children ready and my three-year-old would play shoe store with me while I fed the babies. And uh, I was finishing this, I ran to work to be at the, the core on time and I'm walking along and I felt I was limping and I looked down, I was wearing two totally different shoes and I didn't have time to go back home to change them. So there was a professor who was going to stand on the platform where everybody could see in two very different shoes. So it was a big deal for me to come and do my first time by a lecture. Moreover, some of the really great figures in Humbio, Al Hastorf, Sandy Dornbush, Merton Burnfield, told me they were going to come in here in my lecture and give me comments on it. So I was like doubly nervous. I was nervous because it was the first lecture and then I was nervous because they were going to be there. Well, I unfortunately sped through the lecture <laughs> at a ridiculous pace and um, and got through the end. It was about the evolution of adult lactose tolerance, a topic I still speak on today, but pace it quite differently. I rushed through the lecture, um, obviously too fast. It felt uncomfortably fast to everybody, including me, and a hand went up at the end of the lecture. And I called on the person, and the person said, Professor Durham, would you repeat that, please? <laughs> I started reporting on three experiments in social psychology. They were all in, on a related topic. As I finished the first two and started the third, I suddenly realized I had done the whole damn thing wrong. The experiments one and experiment two went the other way because I knew experiment three perfectly and I knew exactly what that said and that it was consistent with the results of the other two. So I stopped the class and I said to the students, Stop, cross out everything you started to say from this point on, everything you wrote in your notes, and I'll explain to you how I know I got it wrong. And so I went through showing how the theory in which these three were embedded showed clearly what the direction must be for the first two studies, if the third one was correct. At the end of the class, two students came up to me and said, Sandy, that was great teaching. We never heard anybody do a better job of explaining the importance of theory 
in experimental research. I said, you act as if I did that on purpose. They said, sure you did. I said, I did not. I made a mistake twice. They were convinced that I was right. So at the next class, I took a vote. And it was about 60% thought I had faked it. And 40% thought I had made a mistake. And I said to the 60%, you are too impressed by the tuition you have paid. You can't stand the idea that your teacher could be that dumb. But I was that, that dumb. One, one year in the Corps, when I was lecturing in ecology, I was simply talking along, not paying too much attention to exactly the details of the words I was using. And I believe we were talking about something having to do with reproductive biology. And I made some comment about, well, if you hook up with this random guy, not thinking about the meaning of the term uh, hook up, the whole entire class burst out laughing. It took me a minute or two to figure out what I'd said that they were laughing at. And random guy turned out to be the catchword for the rest of the quarter. There was something called guerrilla theater. And guerrilla theater consists of three, four guys or women come together dressed in this kind of Renaissance type costumes. And they would put on a skit, which was an anti-war skit. Well, I knew that they were going to come to my class. It was just a matter of time. And I was teaching in Memorial Auditorium. And so I was just dreading that. Um, well, we had already had those who were lying down on the steps. Students had to step around them. And we, but this was big time disruption. So one day I'm giving a lecture. I hear this flute. They had a flute player who provided the music. The flute and Memorial Auditorium, you know, in the back is a huge space. You can drive a car across it. I had somebody drive a motorcycle. But there were a lot of pranks, you know. But this time, so I continued to talk pretending like I was not hearing anything. But I could, I could hear and see from the corner of my eye they were, they were advancing on stage. And I could see on the face of the students. So they came and standing right behind me. I'm talking as if, you know, they're not there. So the ringleader or the head of this theater kind of touched me on the elbow. So I said, yes. Uh, he said, uh, we are the guerrilla theater and we would like to put on our skit. I said, but I'm not giving a lecture. And he came even closer to me and he said, well, you have, a, you have a choice. You either give us 10 minutes to put this on or you argue with me for 20 minutes. Oh, this is like, oh, glove is, <laughs> is on the ground. Because he had a red hair. <laughs> yeah. <I, laughs> And you could cut the air with a knife, you know, these, these, I don't know, a thousand students are just pairs of eyes. Are, what, what is this guy going to do? So I came even closer to him and I said, look, I don't know how it's going to be after the revolution, but right now I am in charge. <laughs> However, I said, these are, the, these are the paying customers. They are in this class, they're paying tuition. Why don't you put this to a vote? Do they want to hear the guerrilla theater or do they want to continue with my lecture? I'm, I'm counting that they would vote for me. Well, I mean, what could they say? I, okay, we are agreed. Yes, we are agreed. So I turned to the class. I said, we're going to put a vote. And this is the way the questions are going to be phrased. So you want to know ahead of time. So all those who want to see the guerrilla theater, there were a few very loud voices. Those who want me to continue the lecture, big oh yes, okay. So I said, sorry, you know, your classmates would prefer to go to the lecture. So they turned around and got off the stage, but they didn't leave. Lecture finished, and but you know, this is a big distraction. Not only 10, 15 minutes, but you know, I'm, what was I talking about? I don't know where to pick up the thread. So I finished lecture and putting my you know, stuff together. The same guy who got into this conversation with came back. And he looked very hurt. And he said, did you have to humiliate me like this in front of the class? 
I said, I can't believe you're telling this to me. You come into my class, you interrupt me, and you are, you know, giving me an ultimatum, basically, or making an ass out of myself, trying to, and you are complaining that I humiliate you. <laughs> I mean, come on. I also said to him, I said, look, I wouldn't say to the class, but I am on your side. I am against the war. So, you know, it's not that I don't basically agree with your aims. I said, but you're interrupt interrupting my class is not going to stop the war. Everybody had a dog, all these students, and this big dog went up on the stage and <laughs> did a big dump. And, and everybody was astounded, but this, this, I'm trying to think, oh, Clayton, did you know him? Mm -hmm. Anyway, he looked down and looked up, he was a British, you know, and he said, well, I don't think I can top that. 